Hello, I am the Angry Spork, taking issue with Rebirth Batman by Tom King. Penguin reveals that Bane has been faking Catatonia and controlling the city from within Arkham. Bats confronts the villain, but only ends up convincing Gordon that he's losing it, after punching him right in the mustache. If that weren't bad enough, the cape then starts giving harsher-than-normal interrogations to villains. So, concluding that their alliance is now finished, Jimbo destroys the bat signal. Pony Ears returns to the cave where his alternate universe bat dad awaits him. Do you dream about Jesus or quantum mechanics? Issue 61 begins Nightmares, spelled with a K because Dark Knight. The first cover has what looks like him busting through glass, and the variant looks like he's crashing through a wooden barrier with an elastic cord hook to his belt. Given the choice between bungee jumping and taking down the three little pigs for their real estate scam, he chose both. We open to the same old song, Waynes are murdered, whoop de doo who cares, it's been done a million times. But don't worry, because this time, Batman is on the case? Okay, going back in time to investigate his own parents' death does technically add something new to this played out scene, but it's still weird. From talking with Gordon next to the now not destroyed signal, to questioning young Bruce about that night, he tracks down some leads, punches a face or two, before finding the killer. The guy stands trial, seemingly repentant, with a speech about how he was suspicious and cowardly, but not himself. Some time passes, and Bruce insists on seeing him in prison, using his family's connection to the mayor to make it happen. Not even a teenager, and he's already using nepotism at a high school level. How precocious! The killer does most of the talking, not exactly knowing what to say, until Bruce attacks him with a razor. The prison's new take-any-kid-to-work day clearly had its flaws. We find out this isn't actually young Wayne, but Matthew Warner, who's so committed to his master Bruce persona that he created this fantasy that's taken the life of someone who had been in his facility for about a month on non-violent charges. This is his seventh victim at the detention center, whom he claimed killed Thomas and Martha. His butler, Taylor, apparently escaped custody, so the staff figure that's who's been helping him out, paying people off and feeding his delusion. The solution? Send him to Arkham Asylum, even if he's just a kid, because at least Master Bruce won't be the jail's problem anymore. I mentioned in a previous episode that I didn't foresee scenarios where this kid would become a huge threat to Batman, and I think this story kind of proved me wrong. If he still got his butler and his cash to aid him somehow, I could foresee that being used for some interesting stories, even if you could stall him by grounding him from TV and internet for a month. I also noticed how often the dialogue expressed sympathy for him, how he's a poor boy that lived through a horrible crime and all that. It's a sign of Matthew's egotism and narcissism fueling this delusion, and it's a nice touch. It shows how he wants what he perceived Bruce had, convincing himself he'll get what that rich guy has, the status, the public's adoration, a legacy to prove he's worthy of, etc. And the whole story played out like a lot of Batman's detective stories, where he knocks a few guys out and gains clues. And though we can tell something is up from the very premise of Pointy Ears investigating his parents' murder, the reveal is still a surprise, and results in what could have been a good one and done, but uh, more on that later. Issue 62's cover sees Professor Pig in a slaughterhouse, with a Batman-sized patch of wall mostly free of blood splatter. Bruce's first day at the pork chop factory took a very dark turn. The alternate is one of him simply standing around in a tattered cape by Frank Miller. Nothing I'd call overly terrible, unless you just don't like the art style, which is a bit scraggly for my taste, I'll admit. Bats wakes up in a slaughterhouse, collecting his thoughts as he's strung upside down and at Pig's mercy. He ignores the blood in his throat, or why he's apparently screaming, and tries focusing on cutting his ropes, which the narration gets a little graphic in its detail. Once free, he headbutts his captor and goes on the offensive, which gets him stabbed. Hey, the pain means he's alive, and he surrendered his weapon. All you've lost is blood. And this is why Bruce failed medical school. Are you a real doctor or a doctor like Dr. Pepper's a doctor? He does question why he can't hear Pig yammering on, but opts to attack again, knocking him to the ground, but pauses, fearing he might kill the villain, and not knowing what else is in store here, so decides to let him up. 
Pig resumes talking, Batman hoping to get some answers, though he still can't hear him. It's when the nut bar starts noshing on raw meat that Bats remembers recent events. Bane running the city out of his cell, his act of being meek. Made you hit Gordon. He made you! Oh yeah, I'm sure that'll make Jim feel better. Someone made you clock him in a fit of rage. I'm sure the pharmacy has a bunch of apology guards just for that. After Pig inexplicably catches batarangs and dodges a flying kick, Bats tackles him, recalling the story his foe's name is derived from. Pygmalion, a sculptor who called a woman of marble so beautiful, no living being could match it. Falling in love, he prayed his heart out, kissed her, she became real, and they lived happily ever after. Though when they hit a rough patch in their relationship, he just carved out a couple's therapist. Then he remembers his own love, how he prayed, how Nightwing was shot, how not his children, not Gordon, no one is safe from Bane, and the last thing he remembered was seeing his Flashpoint dad. He realizes he's lost, and with the first actual dialogue in this issue, he asks what his narration had asked several times. How did he get here, and how does he get out? Pig unmasks to reveal Robin, Damien, who walks away as Batman realizes he's in a dream. Ooh, I knew that three bean salad was going to come back to haunt me. The art really helped sell this as a weird, trippy fantasy scenario, the clashing colors seeming like you'd need 3D glasses. I'm no expert on dream symbolism, but if I had to guess, I'd think that Pig, as in the story of Pygmalion, represents the pain and confusion Bruce is feeling in regards to Selina, whom he saw as his ultimate chance at happiness, not understanding why she abandoned him. The Damien reveal could mean the love of his son, or his feelings about the engagement, but the kid never seemed to strongly dislike Catwoman for any reason, besides her criminal lifestyle. Perhaps he hadn't been listening to the kid, but again, I'm just guessing. Alternatively, consider that throughout this story, Batman was using force to try and figure out what was going on, when in the end, all he had to do was ask a simple question. It could be his mind telling him that maybe he's using fisticuffs too much to solve his problems. I thought violence would be the answer. So the knife, the light sparkling off its tip, and the motion lines kind of make this look like an R making me wonder if this is supposed to be a very subtle hint about the end reveal. I could be reading into it, it could be a coincidence, but anyway, moving on. Issue 63 starts John Constantine, seen here possibly casting a spell to shrink bats to action figure size for funsies. The alternate sees our hero standing triumphantly over a defeated killer croc. You think his skin could peel off, and not only is he cured, but you could also make some really good handbags? We see Bruce waiting on the roof again in his tux, but this time, Selina actually shows up, and the marriage proceeds. I remember my first cigarette. It was in a dream. Ads from the tobacco industry are getting really intrusive, if you ask me. This is Constantine's narration, going on about this dream where he's running alongside his mom, who had died in childbirth. She kept falling down and getting injured, until telling John to go on without her. More on this later, but it takes place over a couple of splash pages of Bruce and Selina, and then they're back on the streets. Uh, rooftops, rather. Catwoman takes off and John warns they're just another dream, and that at the end, she's going to die. Bats dismisses him and swings off, saying he'll protect his wife and the mystic worries too much. But he doesn't let up, even going so far as to interrupt saucy shower time, much to Bruce's annoyance. This is the last time I list the mansion on Airbnb. When the pair split up on a two-face caper, Batman insists she'll be fine on her own, and John asks why the jail failed to stop Master Bruce from killing his fellow prisoners, or why the renowned sleuth didn't figure out Professor Pig was actually Damien, but it doesn't seem to convince pointy ears. After a rather cute discussion over the grandfather clock entrance to the cave, Constantine shows up yet again, but says he's done arguing. There doesn't seem to be a point, so tells Bruce to enjoy married life in all its temporary comforts. Live the dream! That's it. I'm having Alfred kick you out right now. But this time, he turns into an orange hulk that shoots water from his fingertips. Also, he has an afro. Don't ask me why. No, instead, Wayne just punches him, which he's been doing an awful lot lately, and not just because of the vigilante stuff. He's never understood the mage, saying he could have been one of the greatest superheroes if he wasn't such an idiot. Just because Ricky Gervais's The Office came first doesn't make it better than Steve Carell's. 
Bruce would rather make out with his wife in the Batmobile, but eventually Constantine finds him cradling Catwoman's body, saying a sniper had shot her like Nightwing, possibly KG Beast, but he's not sure. The sorcerer explains that Batman is really hooked to a machine, with his enemies using Scarecrow's fear chemicals to create his previous dreams and those yet to come. They're trying to drive him insane, and nothing can get him out. And John? He's not really there, not able to do anything to get him out. He's just another part of the dream that's becoming a nightmare. And cue all the kids at summer camp laughing at you when you lost your swim trunks in the lake. I guess it's not inconceivable that Bruce cooked up some backstory about Constantine and a dream about his mom, either maybe from his own imagination or based on a conversation the two actually had, but it still works as pretty good misdirection. John seems to be more an outsider, a malcontent that Bruce may not entirely like, given his powers and attitude, but his manifestation in his dream is more about telling him the difficult truth of his situation. He's trapped in a dream, he doesn't know how to get out, and there isn't going to be a magical fix. There's also the detail of Bats wearing his gray and black original suit, something he only started wearing because Selina had left him. And his dialogue in the car, where he asks her to kiss him while he drives, kind of suggests he's known it's a dream, but didn't care. Kind of makes sense, because you can realize you're in a dream, even if you don't fully control what happens. Hey, if I had to leave dreams where I had superpowers, or women were actually interested in me, and I had to return to stinking reality, so do you, fictional character. Wait a minute. And I guess what we read in part one with Matthew Warner was a dream, too. It would explain being the first part of a story called Nightmares, his fevered imagination constructing a scenario where the kid could be a logical threat, maybe? But he was so much very Batman in that story, didn't really get too personal about himself or his life, that it could have just been Matthew creating more details to make his fantasy feel more real. People generally know about the Bat signal. They know that Bats has been on good terms with the police and the commissioner, usually. Though, back to this story, the all-alone remark seems iffy. Batman has so many allies in Gotham alone, it'd take quite a coincidence for them all to be so preoccupied to not notice anything amiss in the cave or manor. Though King has focused more on his male sidekicks. Whether that's due to his creative preferences or editorial decisions, I couldn't tell you. But then, I don't mind avoiding appearances by the orphan mistake. Next up is a bit of a break from Nightmares. The Price of Justice slash Innocence slash Vengeance slash Loyalty. It's another crossover with The Flash in issues 64 and 65 of both titles. It's by Joshua Williamson, not King, and possibly set before events leading into Nightmares, but is relevant. After the League takes out some Amazobots, Batman intervenes on an attack at the Flash Museum, a shadowed figure destroying everything and telling the patrons to run. No one seems killed or even seriously hurt, and Barry arrives soon after to reassure people and investigate the crime scene. But he knows Bruce lied about just being in the neighborhood. Turns out this attack was from Gotham Girl, who'd been making similar symbolic attacks in Gotham recently that we never saw. No one was hurt, but she's now escalated. Why is she doing this, you ask? For her brother Hank. Should we assume Claire went bonkers because she found out Bats never told her about these things called Lazarus Pits? His corpse is hooked up by several tubes to a machine, pumping into and bulging up his veins, reviving him briefly at first before he's gone again. This seems to be her reason for allying with Bane, some kind of plan to bring Hank back. Clues at the museum lead our heroes to a Caribbean island, and a fortress where Claire's been hiding out, in a room full of superhero imagery that borders on obsession. Turns out she and her bro weren't just fans of the Dark Knight. Bat said he told her she needed to stop because her powers were killing her, then admits he wanted her to stop because he didn't want this life for her. But we never got to see that conversation, only her deciding to be a hero and Bat's promising to get her a trainer. Let's not forget, her powers are slowly killing her the more she uses them, so this quasi-confession comes out of nowhere. Remembering Wally, Flash gets angry that Bat's never looked into where the Gothams got their suits, because he had other priorities and leaving things unsolved, like in Sanctuary. Yeah, it's an oversight, but Claire was traumatized for a while, and he had to get the snot beaten out of him by Bane as part of getting her fixed, so I can understand not asking about her tailor. If you're not in the know, Sanctuary is a mental health facility for supertypes, established by Batman and several other heroes. There's more details in Heroes in Crisis, but I haven't read that story, so moving on. They find a lab with several preserved corpses in Gotham suits, though one apparently broke out and was left to decompose for a year. 
Pretty lax janitorial staff, I gotta say. And I can't imagine the smell. Also, slight typo as Flash notes two pods were open without damage. After some super speed analysis, he finds the bodies were pumped full of a steroidal cocktail with one base ingredient. Venom. Margarita Knight gets real crazy on this island. That, and Barry finding a mask I guess connected to Sanctuary, indicates this is a trap, proven when Gotham Girl bursts in, puts a fresh Venom vial in a machine, and activates some super zombies infused with the same powers she has. They attack the heroes because Claire wants to teach Bats a lesson about abandoning those he inspires, and she flies off musing in the next chapter that she needs a better origin story, because she wasn't present for her family's mugging. I could have landed here in a rocket from Planet Gotham. That's a competitor to the Planet Krypton restaurant chain. Not as fun an experience when the waitstaff jump out at you dressed like psycho criminals to take your order. Or been bitten by a radioactive gargoyle. Yeah, but then you turn to stone during the day, and your popular cartoon show would be cancelled by ABC. The duo managed to defeat the undead experiments by forcing them to expel their powers until they disintegrate. Flash loses it on porn ears, how these people died wanting to be heroes like them without knowing the cost. That this is another mystery of Bruce's making things worse for others, and he doesn't plan ahead as well as he claims. He leaves him on the island to find Gotham Girl attacking Central City Police Department, which she had previously mentioned she would target. He tries empathizing with her loss, mentioning someone close to him had died that was a better hero than he is. If he were still around, he'd tell him, meaning Wally, to quit the costumed life, even if he wouldn't listen. But wouldn't you know it, Hank got better, bigger, and apparently still keen on fighting Justice Leaguers. Thanks to Flash being distracted by Iris's presence, Gotham lands a really good punch on Flash and sends him flying, the speedster who actually inspired Hank with his optimism because he was always smiling. Barry Allen is All Might? Lies! Lies and slander, I say! Before continuing, Hank becomes a light show, his body wasting away while he tells his sister he didn't want this, he was happy before, and now he's just scared. Because that won't be traumatic for her to hear. Even his dialogue bubbles are melting, that's never a good sign! Patient, iron high, heart swollen big, you, what makes sick? Claire figures he was dead too long for her benefactor's treatments to really work. Bats arrives trying to apologize and take responsibility, but she sees it as an attempt to control everything, make it all about him. So she takes the same serum that revived Hank and becomes a human light bulb. That's gone insane! She does quite the job wrecking the nearby area, but it's not long before she horks up fluids and drops like a stone. It takes some doing from both leaguers, but they manage to revive her, though the Super Venom racked her nervous system and she has no memory of a recent rampage, or who was giving her orders. Iris emerges from the rubble to give Bats a pointy earful and a smack to the face, accusing him of endangering kids without thinking of the consequences, while Barry enables it all. But Claire has no time for this, so they take her to the Batcave, placing her in a reconstructed cryostasis tube from the island until she heals. However, Bruce's intent to help Claire be the hero she wants to be causes an argument, Barry saying that crime-fighting costs them too much and they aren't really protecting their loved ones since they're always in danger anyway. Iris abducted Alfred shot or a dead Robin. So Wayne hits back that at least he never forgot one of his sidekicks even existed. Well, you kinda did, and then you accepted a cheap imitation as her replacement! Flash is so ticked off, he comes close to Speed Force punching Bats in the face a hundred times, evading the cave's countermeasures, but that's not who he is, so he just leaves. I think my on-camera remark would have been more painful, but that's just me. The story ends with Barry returning home, finding a letter from Iris about how she's going to be gone for a while, live her life, knowing that even if she asked him to leave the costume life behind, it wouldn't last, because Alan decided to pay the price for it, but she can't. For all the lives he can save, he can't save himself, and he ends up alone. The price wasn't bad, but it wasn't great either, mostly because of how dissonant it felt from what was shown in King's previous stories. Batman says he benched Claire after Hank died, which seems inaccurate. She needed treatment to recover from Psycho Pirate, and when she did, Bats let her decide, making her aware that he wasn't happy in the caped life. They had a heart-to-heart -heart about what he does. She knew using her powers would kill her, but still wanted to keep up the superhero thing, to help people. So she was going to be set up with a trainer so she could forego her powers and not die. 
We didn't get to see any of that, or what apparently made Bruce change his mind and led her to Bane's camp. Also note, she was watching the League fight with the Amazobots. It's not that Iris and Barry don't have something of a point about the repercussions of younger generations being inspired by Batman or even the Flash, but that feels undermined when they clearly don't have all the facts, and what they're told is very glib and lacking important details and context. Did Williamson just not research what was going on? If you're going to exposit, then be accurate, consarnate! It's even admitted that there was nothing Barry could have done to stop Wally, and how Bruce's orders never stopped any of his Robins, so they're talking like Claire didn't make her own decisions. Yeah, this is after Wally's apparent death in Heroes in Crisis, so there's a lot of hurt going on. Maybe Bats deserves a little blame, like how he insists on tackling so much on his own, but it feels like he gets more than is warranted, and it doesn't really focus on the problem actually being from his lone wolf attitude. Flash was correct, the Gotham's costumes would be a good lead, but they never seemed particularly special to me. They got torn like most fabrics, and didn't look like anything they couldn't have made themselves. Much like wherever they bought their powers, it was never followed up on after Claire got better, so it feels like blaming Batman for what might have been Tom King's or an editor's oversight. However, it does have something to say about how far heroes can go with their sacrifice and the problems it can cause, whether it's somehow deluded and misled, like Gotham Girl, or well-intentioned but flawed, like Bats or the Speedster. Hope you like that odd intermission, because we return to Nightmares with issue 66. Yeah, it feels a little disjointed, but that sometimes happens in comics. I guess the writer having an event story happening at the same time just makes it more likely. The cover looks pretty cool, our hero flying upwards, various foes, and Catwoman hanging onto him while he surges with electricity. They laughed when he told them he had found a way to achieve Super Saiyan 2. The alternate has him punching Two-Face with a slew of other villains waiting for their chance to, I guess, be punched as well. We open to some dialogue that's pretty tongue-in-cheek, but still clever, as Selina has a chat with the question. You do everything he wants? In his dreams. The only thing that could have made it more clever is if we didn't already know this was, well, you know. Anyway, she recalls first meeting Bruce on the street, liking his face and noticing how he wanted to be tough, but still treated her gently as they fought. She carries on to a time when Two-Face paid her to set him up at a museum so he could kill the bat. But she ended up double-crossing him, and they defeated him and his crew. Which, to be fair, he of all people should have seen coming. I don't know, he's the one with a fixation on twos and doubles and such. If anything, he should expect himself of double-crossing... Um... Himself? Where was he going with this? Okay, now you're you, I'm me. I'm me? It was after this incident that they started working closer more regularly. Though, over time, they'd have tensions, break away, find other people, only to be drawn back to each other. No, I'm not doing a friends, we were on a break joke, that's just too obvious. We get a couple pages that I particularly like. Batman across interchanging foes, on the ground, bloody, wounded, but getting up and punching whichever villain's lights out. It's a good visual for showing his indomitable attitude, never giving up, as Kyle goes on about how, as much as she and the various rogues have trained and practiced for various gimmicks and paths, none of them are him. Yet, she adds, when he lost his parents and promised to war on criminals, he put that vow above everything else, all the pain, instinct to surrender, and even love. Admittedly, it makes for an awkward About You page on his dating profile. He can't be Batman and anything else, much less happy, and Question gets rather vocal, asking for the real reason that she left, at least according to narration boxes. He goes on that both of them are just part of Bruce's series of nightmares, and this questioning is the closest his mind has to an escape. Throughout this issue, she's repeatedly told her interrogator to read the note she left, and he finally addresses it, how she walked away from the marriage so he could go on superheroing. But now as Bruce proverbially stands, unprepared, his family and city at risk, and himself captured by Bane, Question asks, if her reasoning was to make Bats stronger, why is he so weak? Uh, he forgot to have his protein shake after his morning workout. Protein helps with recovery, you know. Selina takes one last puff of her cigarette and admits she lied. I'm not a natural blonde. Seems this issue was intended for Bruce's subconscious to uncover why the love of his life left him. He had some kind of explanation, the oft-mentioned note, but of course, as we saw during I Am Suicide, a note isn't enough for bats, 
and he apparently arrives at the same conclusion here, that she lied, for some reason. Weird, since Holly seemed to convince her that bats and happiness just don't mix. Though, would they not end up reconsidering this when it's all revealed later their breakup was part of Bane's schemes? Issue 67's cover is pretty story-centric. Bats chasing a guy in a trench coat. Minimalistic in a sense, but still good. No variant, so we begin this largely silent comic with the detective confronting a masked man standing over a dead body in what would appear to be a dark and blue costume. Beep beep. It's not Bluebird, however. That would make this a good dream. Of course, the perp makes a run for it, jumping off a roof, grabbing a clothesline that breaks, sending him swinging into the bedroom of a couple in bed, bats giving chase the whole way. Snagged by the bat rope, he just takes off his shoe. Beep beep. Down some fire escapes, into a building, down further several floors of spiral stairs, until Pornier's Ears hits him with a batarang. That is then used against him. Beep beep. Batman isn't chasing him about the murder. The guy just refuses to turn off his annoying watch alarm. Back outside, then crashing through the ceiling of a bar, tended by a bald man with a pushed-up nose, stuttering through Batman's various nicknames, before telling him which way the suspect went. He follows the masked man into the sewers. I hate this! Ooh, I hope that thing that just floated by was a candy bar. Catches up and tackles him deeper into the fetid depths, removing his mask to reveal... The Joker. This crossover with Spider-Man Noir took a weirder turn than I expected. The issue ends with Bats' narration, how he asked Mr. J why he killed the man on the roof, one William Ernest Coyote, and the clown's response, much like his horn, was... Beep beep. Yeah, this whole scenario was very much Looney Tunes inspired, making it a fun ride with an appropriate foil and Joker. While we had previously seen the stuttering barkeep in the wedding, he's very much meant to be Porky Pig. Some of the chase, which, while still feeling very appropriate of a Batman comic, also shared elements of something from the classic cartoons, sometimes humorous like with that couple, and sometimes how things seemed convenient for the guy getting chased. Mostly without dialogue, like the Roadrunner cartoons, hence the beep beeps, Though here's what I found weird. The victim's name is meant to evoke Wild E. Coyote, certified genius, but his body is wearing a costume with a beak-like nose and what look like turned up feathers on the cowl, and that color scheme more resembles Roadrunner. Doesn't make much sense unless Wild E. finally caught and skinned the Roadrunner to wear his skin. If anyone is the Coyote, it's Batman, except his gadgets don't blow up in his face. Most of the time. Issue 68's cover has Selina in a superhero-themed strip club, joined by Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, and two women I don't recognize, while Bats fails to get a hold of her on the phone. I feel like this is referencing a meme I'm unaware of. Selina and Lois Lane are very drunk after having visited several bars, and Supergirl lets them into the Fortress of Solitude. Despite their inebriation, they could go for some wine, and the super robots that tend the place inform them that true Superman doesn't partake in alcohol, but has 37,000 bottles of various wines gifted to him from across the cosmos. The way they say true Superman makes me want to read their dialogue in the voice of the guy who voiced Cal in the Super Friends cartoon, Danny Dark. Sure, he changed it from his birth name, but still weird that he got to voice the Blue Boy Scout, right? They sample various drinks, aged between a few decades to millions of years. One's even called Death to Superman Cabernet Sauvignon. Wonder how that went. Someone from Kunda sends him a space parcel with a note reading, Merry Christmas, here's some booze dedicated to your demise. There's also just... Diamonds? Yeah, there's a fun journey for your intestines. And from the Reach, Beetle Juice. Don't drink it three times or Michael Keaton will appear. Off his meds. They take a dip in some pool Lois forgets the name of, filled with a liquid that instills the body with bliss from head to toe. It was originally a trap designed by Brainiac, intended to make one so relaxed and at peace they'd never want to leave. And yet, not only did Clark leave, the ladies eventually do as well. After that, they try on super suits and enjoy an android strip show. Please insert bills into abs. Coins go in the slot in the armpit. And what are the guys up to at Bruce's bachelor party? <sighs> Having soup, looking at paintings of his forebearers done by a Finnish artist, watching some football, and playing chess. Clark offers any advice his brooding friend might have, saying he finds marriage rewarding and actually helpful to their caped line of work. 
but of course the rich boy focuses on the game. Mate! Are you coming on to me? Hot crackers, I take exception to that! I'm not hearing a no. In the study, Kent says this must be Wayne's worst nightmare. Everyone, including himself, happy and safe, and his vigilantism not needed. Bruce tries to argue this is just his life now, but Four Eyes disagrees. The reason Selina left him, why he drove her away, why he thinks the Boy Scout can be married but the Dark Knight can't, is that the farm boy loves being Superman, but hates that he has to be Superman, while the detective hates being Batman, but loves that he has to be. But remember, this is your drug-addled unconscious mind's assessment of me, so take that part with a grain of salt, at least. Thanks to Lois stealing Jimmy Olsen's signal watch, Clark flies over to pick the ladies up, with Bruce taking one of his planes, suggesting Supes might drop his bride-to-be on a long flight back. I've carried the galaxies without dropping them. She's more important than the galaxies. Aww. They arrive as Lois and Selina intend a future party at the Batcave, and Wayne brags about beating Superman at chess. In his own dream, remember? And in case this lovey-dovey scene where they reunite and Catwoman's all happy she made a friend had made you forgotten what's happening in the waking world, the last page reminds you Bats is hooked to a machine influencing all of this. While I'm not the biggest fan of debauchery, this was a fun issue. Perhaps showing Bruce figuring how well Selina and Lois would hit it off on a girl's night out based on their double date. Superman, as a journalist and icon to the world, fits as a dream figure to point out certain harsh truths that Pointy Ears keeps to himself. You know, investigation, x-ray vision and all that. That he apparently likes that his dark identity gives him some purpose. But I guess he doesn't like that he likes it. It might also suggest that he knows he can go to Clark for more down-to-earth advice, like marriage. Being from Bruce's perspective, he could be wrong, though maybe he's right that soups can drink diamonds. On to the final chapter of the arc, where the cover has Catwoman hanged by Batman's hand like they were dancing off some angelic statues. It's actually kinda sweet, until he remembers she dumped him and lets go. Thomas has been engaging in some regular sparring with his friend Bane, who wanted to go a few extra rounds. At first, I thought this was part of Bruce's dream, where later in life he and the Brood had made peace, but then I noticed how only one of them looked older. Anywho, Bane becomes resentful of Thomas, a spoiled rich man, and brags about breaking the bat, until the old-timer remodels his face while saying he's just been playing games, and that both he and his son need to learn that Thomas is Batman. Should we be expecting some inter-universal copyright lawyers to settle this? Bane doesn't care who wears the ears, gaining the upper hand and wanting his ally to die. To which Thomas pulls a gun and tells him, you first. Not unlike an episode of New Gotham Adventures. It involves the same villain, Bane, and it's an episode also about someone's scarecrow-induced nightmare. The loony luchador calls this cheating, but the old man considers it winning. Which feels taken directly from when Batman beat Prometheus in Grant Morrison's JLA run. Old man Tommy's had his fun, but for now, Gotham awaits. The other half of this issue begins with music, as Wayne wants Selina to dance with him. But, like with his proposal, she only does it after he's properly asked instead of demanded. Dancing through their various costumes over the decades, he explained how he's been trapped in a series of nightmares by Bane, subjected to Scarecrow Toxin. He last remembers finding Alfred in the cave before being surprised by his alternate Pappy, figuring he's involved in this attempt to drive him mad. That whole don't-be-Batman advice seems to be a kind of shared motivation with the brute to stop Bruce. When his mind created John Constantine and the question to help fight back, the dosage got increased, and that made him fight to get back to Selina, leading to this dance. Fortunately, he trained himself to recognize the effects of Crane's various chemicals and caught on to what was happening. It wasn't even a preparation for the future kind of thing. Crime was low for a week, and one night he just got really bored. Turns out, too much fear can overpower the toxins, with his adrenal glands producing the proper defenses when he's found his greatest fear. Asking Selina why. I mean, really, the last airbender in 4K? You didn't even steal it, you paid money for it. He read her note, but knew her well enough to determine it was a lie. Dreamcat tells him that his greatest fear is his simplest truth. He doesn't actually love her. The moment he made that vow, he chose war over love of anyone or anything. He denies it several times, saying he has to love her, but she reiterates the contrary. The comic ends with her thanks for the dance, but now it's time to wake up.
So ends the nightmares, where we had several interesting, clever, and sometimes trippy experiences for the Caped Crusader. It was a well-structured wrap-up and summation of Bruce's experiences, how his mind processed his captivity and fought back. We had some of King's well-trotted callbacks to past eras and some, let's call them loving references to previous animated and comic stories, though what sticks in my mind is how this is all essentially from Batman's own perspective, and while he's intelligent and observant, he's capable of making mistakes, which was the whole point of Cold Days, right? It's possible he's confusing some other doubt or vulnerability with not loving Selina as much as he thought. It's one thing he really should ask a shrink about, but if he didn't do that when he decided to dress like a flying rodent, he probably won't now. If I'm being honest, after so much investment in these two, to just say he doesn't love her feels like a cop-out to validate the he-can't-be-happy-and-Batman argument, but then again, I think it'd make more sense to say he's not used to feeling happy, or per Mask of the Phantasm, he didn't expect it. But there's still more than a dozen issues to go for possible context and elaboration, which we'll get to after another break. Seriously, this is more exhausting than a year of crossovers. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues. Mm -hmm. 